Dr. Tao is a principal member of the technical staff at Sandia National Lab and chief scientist of its Energy Frontier Research Center for Solid State Lighting Science. His work involves integrated science, technology, and economic modeling in solid state lighting. Today's uh, talk is titled Solid State Lighting. It's also about human productivity. Dr. Tao is a graduate of Stanford University, where he earned his AB in mathematics and MS in electrical engineering. Then he went on to Harvard, where he got his uh, master's and PhD in applied physics. Jeff has been active in material research society. He has served at various times on program committees of American Vacuum Society, <coughs> excuse me, the Electronic Material Conference, and the North American MBE Conference. He was elected Fellow of the American Physical Society in 1996 and Fellow of the American Association for the Advance, Advancement of Science in 2009. Jeff has authored or co-authored over 100 publications and holds uh, nine U.S. patents. So please join me in welcoming Jeff. Oh, great. Um, thank you, Padre. It's, it's a pleasure to be here to help uh, uh, to help honor your young Stuckey Award winner, uh, whoever that person is <laughs> in the audience, as well as, I guess, in a sense, to honor Donald Stuckey himself, who, of course, made so many contributions to Corning and to the world and, and uh, all the Corning wear that we have in our house <laughs> uh, still. This is actually the second time I've been to Corning, uh, as I just, just mentioned to Raj this morning. Uh, the first time was as a young kid fresh out of graduate school, uh, interviewing for a job, and then, of course, the second time here as an older older guy, <laughs> and just kind of a symmetry to that, although I kind of wish I were on the younger side of, the, of that symmetry. <laughs> um, so what I'd like to do is talk to you today about lighting. I know lighting is a technology that has intersected over the years uh, many of Corning's businesses, so I'll try to sort of mention a little bit of that as I, as I go. And... Um, in particular, I'd like to talk about solid-state lighting, uh, which is a technology, as many of you know, that is poised to really transform the way the world is lit. Um, and, and I've given my talk this sort of provocative title. It's also, uh, also about human productivity, as if someone might think that it's not about human productivity. And I'll, I'll mention that in a few minutes, um, why someone might not think that. Uh, but before I do that, I'd like to just lay out the sort of obvious case for why one would think that it is about human productivity. So to do that, here I've sketched out sort of a very brief uh, history of the evolutionary biology of, of vision. You know, vision basically means meaning seeing uh, using, using light. Um, and so here on the left, um, I show a photo of a, a fossil of a trilobite. And as many of you may know, trilobites are the first known animal to have an imaging eye, that is, to be able to image objects uh, illuminated by the sun. Uh, and many evolutionary bio biologists believe that this was really one of the key pivotal events in e evolutionary biology, and that it helped fuel the so-called Cambrian explosion, which about 540 million years ago or so, uh, in, in the blink of geological time, all 36 animal phyla sort of appeared uh, almost, all, almost all at once. Uh, and the idea is that once you had an imaging eye, you could, an animal could become a predator, uh, other animals could become prey, and this sort of predator-prey arms race, uh, so to speak, could provide a very powerful source of evolutionary selection pressure. Uh, and cause then all sorts of body plans and shapes to, uh, uh, to evolve very, very quickly. Um, now, before long, animals 
continued to evolve, of course, and took advantage of the fact that sunlight is not just a monochromatic light, but is white and contains a spectrum of colors, uh, and evolved, of course, the ability to, to distinguish between those colors. And birds are sort of a classic, nice example of, of that. As many of you know, birds are tetrachromatic, uh, tetrachromats. That is, they see, they have four color sensors uh, in their eyes, as opposed to us uh, poor humans, we only have three. Uh, so we're trichro trichromats. And that's sort of obvious maybe when you look at birds. They're very, very colorful. So they, they use their ability to see colors very, very well to do perhaps one of the most important of biological functions to attract mates. Um, and as some of you may know, sort of earlier in this year, um, uh, it was recently discovered that dinosaurs, which are the ancestors of the modern bird, also may have had very good color vision. We sort of think of dinosaurs as being brown and gray and not very colorful. But, um, but in fact, dinosaurs might have been very colorful, and they might have used, just as birds do now, that excellent color vision to do the same thing that birds do, attract mates. Um, okay, now, mammals are a little bit different. Um, as, again, some of you may know, the ancestor of mammals was trichromat, uh, is believed to be trichromat. That is, they could see three, uh, three colors. But because mammals spent a long period of evolutionary time as nocturnal animals, um, they came out uh, during when, when the moon was there, they actually lost one of their color sensors, so they became dichromat. So this gray wolf uh, is uh, dichromat, and the descendant of the gray wolf, the modern dog, uh, is also by and large uh, dichromat as well. So they see colors the way sort of a, a, a human, some human males which are, who are colorblind uh, might, might see the world. It was only later when um, uh, primates began to come out during the day uh, that they re-evolved, like this baboon here and this very colorful uh, human child, uh, when they came out during the day, that they re-evolved the third color sensor and became trichromat again. So we, of course, are by and large, except for those few human males who are not, uh, we are by and large trichromat. So, so, so this is just meant to sort of give a sort of a sense of why it is about human productivity or it, why lighting vision or lighting is about productivity. It allows us to do these very important things. It allows us to be predators. Um, it allows us also to be prey, to <laughs> which could be a bad thing. Um, it, allows us to, it allows us to attract mates, um, or allows animals to attract mates. It allows us to hunt and forage for food much more effectively. Um, many people believe that's why, the, our, as primates, we re-evolved that third color sensor so we could distinguish between ripe berries versus unripe berries and foods that were that are able to eat and foods that we're not able, uh, uh, not able to eat. So, so in a way, it's sort of obvious. It's about vision and lighting is about, about productivity. So why would anyone think that it's not about productivity? Um, so so to, to illustrate that, um, or to see why someone might not think it's about productivity, here I show sort of a wide 200-year span of of, of the history of the efficiency of lighting technology. So the bottom axis is, is year 1850 to 2050. The left axis is power conversion efficiency. And here on the lower left, you see a bunch of lighting technologies based on combustion or fire. Um, and you can see that there was actually quite a bit of progress in the Industrial Revolution between 1850 and 1900. Uh, as one moved from oil to gas and kerosene to gas mantle lamps, the efficiency of combustion-based lighting technologies increased by a factor of 10 uh, uh, or so. But they were still all pretty low. They were still all less than 1% uh, in general. Okay, then in the uh, late 19th century, as you all know, one of the great inventions of the last couple of centuries, probably the incandescent light bulb, uh, was invented first based on carbon filaments, uh, and then based on tungsten filaments. And I think this is something that I just learned recently, but Corning, of course, was very involved, heavily involved in the early manufacturing of these incandescent uh, lamps. And I think in 1920, 21 or so, William Woods here uh, invented the so-called Corning ribbon uh, machine, which uh, automated the process of manufacture of the, of the incandescent lamp. And I, and I also just learned this. Uh, apparently, these machines, the descendants of these machines are so efficient that it only takes about 15 of these machines to supply the entire world's 
supply of incandescent lamps, uh, incandescent bulbs. I, I thought that was that's just ama amazing. Um, but incandescent lamps are still not that efficient, um, on the order of three and a half percent power conversion efficiency or so. Okay, then in the latter half of the 20th century, you see the fluorescent uh, tube, uh, which increased by another factor of five, the efficiency of, of, of lighting. So now we're up at, say, 20, 25 percent efficiency uh, or so. Okay, so now on the same plot, you see the sort of, on this time scale anyway, the meteoric rise of solid state uh, lamps. Uh, first, uh, red light-emitting diodes uh, based on a sort of a suite of materials. And then in the 1990s, uh, an even faster rise due to the, uh, uh, the use of gallium nitride-based uh, materials in the blue and, and, and in the green. And then you also see here uh, in the smaller white circles uh, the, uh, the development of white uh, lighting uh, based on either mixing of LEDs or the mixing of LEDs with various phosphor uh, materials, and you can see that right about now the efficiency has reached something like 16 percent. Okay, 16 percent is sort of the state-of-the-art commercial uh, uh, white LED that you can go out now and sort of buy at Home Depot. Uh, it's still very expensive, but at least it has a reasonably good efficiency. In fact, this 16 percent, of course, is much more efficient than incandescent lamps, and you can see that it's poised to to increase beyond what fluorescent uh, tubes can do. In fact. There is no reason to believe, at least in my mind, that in-GAN-based uh, white light sources could not achieve efficiencies as high as 70, 75, maybe even closer to 100%. Um, so, so this is why um, someone might think that lighting and solid-state lighting isn't about productivity, but is fa in, in fact all about energy savings, it's because light-emitting diodes have the potential to be so efficient 70 to 100 percent efficiency, um, that the first thing you think of is how much energy you'll save. Um, so to illustrate that here on top, and, and these axes are aligned, so the years actually do correspond, uh, this plot above and this plot below. But here you see uh, energy consumption in the U.S., and that's actually in terms of the ratios, it's about, some, it's about the same uh, worldwide. But um, U.S. Uh, uh, electricity consumption in the U.S. is about one-third of all energy consumption. Um, lighting consumption is about one-fifth of all electricity consumption, so altogether it's about one-fifteenth of all primary energy uh, consumption. And in 2010 now, sort of roughly, that corresponds to about 90 gigawatts of uh, electricity that's used for lighting in the U.S. So you could imagine if you could improve the efficiency of lighting by factor of two, maybe even a factor of three, um, you would not need 90 gigawatts, you might only need 45 gigawatts. And so you would save 45 gigawatts of energy. And so this is sort of the origin of why the case has, is often made that lighting is all about energy efficiency, it's all about energy savings. Um, and in fact, for maybe 10 years, uh, when we first started thinking about solid state lighting at Sandia Labs anyway, um, that was the first argument that we made to the Department of Energy, that uh, efficient lighting is going to save uh, a ton of energy. Okay, until about maybe, I don't know, a couple years ago, we started to think a little bit more about, well, what are the hidden assumptions behind that kind of energy savings? And the hidden assumption, of course, is that our consumption of light is saturated, that we have all the light that we need to be as productive as we would like to be. And if we're in a world like that, where our consumption of light is saturated, then, of course, if you make the efficiency of lighting more efficient, uh, if you make lighting more efficient, then you will consume less, uh, you know, less, less, less energy. Um, in fact, we probably have never lived in a world like that. And to illustrate that, here I show um, a lot of data from a lot of different sources. This is all in sort of empirical estimates of lighting consumption in various parts of the, of the world and in various uh, stages in time. Uh, throughout, uh, throughout history. And let me just sort of point out a few, I, I won't talk about all the data points, but let me point out just a, f a, a few. Uh, two of them come from the contemporary world, um, or uh, two that I'd like to point out come from the contemporary world. One is the U.S. in 2001. This was a study by Navigant. Um, 
uh, and they estimated the uh, consumption of light in the U.S. is about 136 megalumen hours per person year. So, so let me point out that the units I'm using here are all per capita consumption of light units, and the symbol that sometimes people use is lowercase phi, and the units are megalumen hours per person year, where lumen is sort of the unit, standard unit of light uh, visible to the human eye. So the U.S. in 2001 consumed something like 136 per person megalumen hours uh, per person year. And to put that in perspective, uh, 136 megalumen hours per person year corresponds to the average person in the U.S. being surrounded during his or her waking hours by s roughly 17 100 watt light bulbs. Okay, so that's a lot of light. That doesn't mean that each individual is directly surrounded by 17 100 watt light bulbs. But if you integrate over all sorts of other uses like traffic lights or, or, or outdoor street lights or factory lights or, or, or lights in rooms that you're not in at the time but you're going to go in or you just left and you forgot to not whatever, it ends up being about 1,700 watt. Uh, so, so, so the U.S. Is, is the lighting, is the lumens, I don't know, lumens hog of the world. I mean, it, it, it uses the most light per capita of, of any country uh, in the world. Okay, the second point I'd like to call attention to is also in the contemporary world. It's the world not on grid electricity in 1999. Evan Mills at the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab uh, did an estimate of the consumption of light in this. This is the, the developing world, uh, uh, not on grid electricity. So they're using kerosene lamps uh, basically for their lighting. And he estimated that their per capita consumption of light is about 0 0.043 megalumen hours per person year. And to calibrate you on that, that's equivalent to the average person in that world being surrounded by a half watt light bulb during his or her waking hours, uh, which is a factor of two to four to five uh, less light than, the, than, than a normal night light that, 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 that a person here in the U.S. Uh, would use. So, so definitely this is the lumens miser of the world in a way, the, the world not on grid electricity. Um, so there's a whole bunch of other data points, but I wanted to also call attention to one series in this um, sort of, it's a little hard to read, this uh, dark red, reddish brown series. This is sort of a monumental work by Roger Fouquet and Peter Pearson at Imperial College in the UK. And they did estimates of per capita light, or of lighting consumption in the UK over 300 years or so, all the way back to 1700. Uh, over a variety of fuel sources, all the way from candles to oil to gas, kerosene to modern uh, electric lighting. And you see that the per capita consumption spans an incredibly wide range from 46.4 megalumen hours per person year down to 0 0.00058 megalumen hours per person year. So this is an astonishing range. And to kind of maybe calibrate you on that, we can sort of compare these numbers with the two numbers that I just mentioned. Uh, the world not on grid electricity consumes 0.043 megalumen hours per person a year. That's about equivalent to what the UK consumed or the average person in the UK consumed uh, about 150 years ago in sort of 1850 uh, or, or, or so. Um, likewise, in the US, we consume 136 megalumen hours per person a year. That's to put sort of that in context, um, that's about 250,000 times more light than the average person in the UK consumed in 1750. Okay, and in 1750, the, the population of inner London was something like 650,000 people. It was one of the more populated cities uh, of that era. Uh, so 650,000 people. Um, there's a factor of 250,000 more light that we're consuming. So that kind of means that the average person in the U.S., three people in the U.S. Uh, in 2001 consumed as much light as the entire inner city of London in 1750. So, so this is sort of another astonishing statistic in terms of how, uh, how light consumption has changed over the years. So, so, so the main point I, I want to make with this view graph is basically that, that lighting consumption has increased dramatically over the past few centuries. Um, and, and, and there is no sign of saturation uh, up until now even. There's, no, there's been no sign of saturation. So, so now to make that even more sort of quantitative, or to, uh, here, here, I, here I plot uh, those points. 
uh, that I just showed, those empirical estimates that I, that I, that I just showed you. Um, and, and, but now I'm plotting a slightly different thing. Now I'm plotting big fee. Okay, so big fee is, is total consumption of light. So this is not per capita consumption, but total consumption. And I'm using the units petalumen hours per year. So petalumen is that's a really big unit of, uh, of light, of course. Um, and then on the uh, horizontal axis, I'm plotting this really funny, weird quantity, which is a factor, just a constant factor beta, okay, times gross domestic product, GDP, uh, divided by cost of light. And if you use as your units for gross domestic product um, giga dollars per year or billions of dollars per year, and if you use your, as your units for cost of light um, dollars per megalumen hour, uh, then what you find is that this ratio has the same units, petalumen hours per year, as the vertical axis does. And if you choose this constant beta to be this, a magic number, 0 0.0072, what you find is that these empirical data points fall pretty much on a line of slope one with zero offset. Um, so this is actually quite astonishing. Actually, when we first did this plot, uh, I thought absolutely there's some mistake that's happened here, and so we kept going back through the data. And, and of course, these estimates are non-trivial to make, so there's certainly got to be a lot of error bars, both uh, on the vertical axis as well as on the horizontal axis. Nevertheless, it was sort of astonishing uh, that these data points fall pretty much on this, on this line. And that has two implications. One implication is that as the wealth of the world has increased, or the wealth of people has increased, as GDP has increased, uh, people have consumed more light. Um, linearly. The elasticity with respect to income is about one. Um, the elasticity of the consumption of light is about one. And the second implication is that as light has gotten cheaper, um, also we've consumed more. As light is, if, if basically as light has gotten more affordable, which is kind of the ratio of GDP to cost of light, uh, we've consumed more light with an elasticity of about, uh, of about one. Okay, so let me again call out just a few data points to kind of maybe drive this home a, a, a little bit. Um, and so here in this table, I've listed a few uh, of those data points from the contemporary world, and I've listed a few quantities. One is cost of light, uh, which I've written as approximately equal to the cost of the fuel, the cost of the energy that you're burning to create light, divided by the efficiency with which you're creating that light. So eta is luminous efficacy in units of lumens per watt, and cost of energy is in units of dollars per megawatt hour. Okay, I also list uh, total gr gross domestic product, which of course is just population times per capita uh, GDP. And then I also list uh, big fee, that's total consumption of light, petalumen hours per year, and then little fee, which is this sort of per capita uh, consumption of light uh, figure in megalumen hours per person year. Um, and, and so the U.S. in 2001 is this blue data point right here. Um, and and, and, of course, it consumes a lot of light. It consumes about a third of the entire world's uh, light. Okay, so the U.S., again, is the lighting hog of, 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 of the world. And that's true partly because the U.S. is rich. Okay, the U.S. is obviously a wealthy country. But interestingly enough, it's also in part because the U.S. has a fairly low cost of energy compared to the rest of the world, uh, something like um, $76 per megawatt hour on average, uh, compared to $120 per megawatt hour for the world as a whole. And because of that uh, lower cost of energy, that means its cost of light uh, is also a, a little bit lower than the rest of the world, $2.0 per mega lumen hour instead of 3.3. And so that also causes, or that also is correlated with the U.S. Uh, consuming more light. So it's not just because the U.S. is wealthier, but it's also because the U.S. has lower costs, uh, costs of energy. Okay, the world not on grid electricity, that's this green point over here. Uh, and you can see that it consumes much, much less energy, something like one two thousandths of, of, of what the world uh, consumes, as, even though it represents about one third of the world in terms of population. There's about two billion people in this world not on grid electricity compared to something like six or seven billion uh, in the world as a whole. Okay, and again, partly this is because that's a very poor world. Um, it has a GDP of something like $4 uh, trillion compared to a world GDP of 60 
uh, trillion dollars or so, despite the fact that it has two billion, uh, two billion people. But even more so, the second reason why it consumes a lot less light, uh, and the more important reason is because its lighting technology is kerosene lamps. And so its eta, its luminous efficacy, is very, very low, 0 0.3. It's less than one lumen per watt uh, compared to a world average of uh, 40 to 50 lumens per watt. And that very, very low luminous efficacy translates to a very high cost of light, about $600 per megalumen hour. And it's that really high cost of light, coupled, of course, with its, uh, with its low GDP, that causes it to consume much, much less light uh, than the rest of the world. Um, okay, so, so then let me also just mention the world in 2005. That's this point, this gray circle right here. Um, which is just the ag aggregate for the entire world. And that world consumes something like 130 petalumen hours uh, per, uh, per year. And it doesn't seem like there's a big difference here, but notice that this is sort of a two orders of magnitude per grid division scale. So, so small differences on this plot actually are, uh, are pretty significant. Okay, so what could one imagine um, in a future world, let's say the world in 2030, so let's imagine a world in 2030 where solid state lights are everywhere. Uh, they have transformed the way the world is lit. And light has become much more efficient, much more efficient. Uh, cost of light has become much cheaper. Uh, and that, that less expensive light has spurred more productivity. So there are more uses for light. Um, what would one imagine? Okay, so I want to make a caveat here that, 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 of course, we don't know what will happen in the future, 2030. That's a long way away. Um, it could be that we are indeed saturated, at least in the developed world. That is possible. But let's suspend judgment for, for just a minute and, and imagine that we are not saturated and imagine that, in fact, these lower costs of light will lead to uh, new uses of light. And if you do that and if you just extrapolate uh, along this curve um, and if you use estimates um, for world GDP that are consistent with the EIA, Energy Efficiency, Energy Information Agency of, of the Department of Energy, if you look at their projections and, and, and they're projecting something like $140 trillion a year for world GDP uh, and energy prices that are actually, surprisingly enough, uh, roughly constant at about $120 per megawatt hour. If you, do all, if you do all that and you assume that solid state lighting will ultimately have an efficiency that's on the order of 70% or so, wall plug efficiency. So that corresponds to about 268 lumens per watt. Then what you end up with is a world consumption of light in 2030 that's on the order of 1,700 petalumen hours per year. And that's this data point, uh, not data point, that's this, that's this projected estimate uh, in the uh, purple outlined white diamond uh, up there. And that's about a factor of 10 higher uh, consumption of light, 1,700 versus 130. It's a little more than a factor of 10 higher than the, what the world consumes in, uh, consumed in 2005. So a factor of 10. So, that, so, so this would be a world that consumes 10 times more light. And you can imagine sort of this Earth at night photo from NASA being 10 times brighter. I mean, that would be a tremendous amount of, uh, of, of light that the world would be consuming. Um, okay, so, so, so having this estimate in hand, now one can do things like estimate what would sort of, uh, so in a way that's a market, that's a market for, that's a business market for light that someone's going to supply, uh, both the lamps that produce the light as well as the electricity that's being used to, uh, uh, that's being consumed to produce that light. Um, so you can estimate things like what would, whoops, what would the chip area um, be that would be needed to light that world um, that's consuming 10 times more light than we're uh, consuming right now? So here on the left, I've written that demand for light or that consumption of light. And that's just this beta uh, constant factor times GDP, uh, but divided by cost of light. But now I've rewritten the cost of light as approximately the cost of energy divided by this luminous efficacy. Um, and if you know that that light is going to be satisfied by or being produced by semiconductor chips, uh, and if you know something about the operating characteristics of those semiconductor chips, then you can sort of write down an expression for the supply uh, of that light from those semiconductor chips. 
And I've written that as a product of four things. There's input power density to the chip. There's the area of the chip, or the total area of all the chips that you would need to supply uh, that amount of light. There's this luminous efficacy factor. And then there's a duty cycle. The lamps probably aren't on all the time. And that's supply. And, and if you just blindly equate demand with supply, then you can solve for this area. And this would be the area that you would need to light the world. Uh, basically. And that's this expression down here in the lower left. This is the area that you would need to light the world. It's this beta times GDP divided by cost of energy. Uh, there's a power density in there. There's a duty cycle in there. And one thing that's really interesting is you notice that luminous efficacy is not there. Um, and the reason luminous efficacy is not in this equation is because there's a cancellation. Luminous efficacy uh, if it increases, it decreases the cost of light. And if it decreases the cost of light, it increases the demand for light. But if you increase luminous efficacy, then you also decrease the area of the chip that you need to produce that light. And so those two effects c exactly cancel each other. And so this formula down here for the area that you would need to light the world doesn't have luminous efficacy in it. So so this already, just as a side point, this 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 is could be construed as a problem for manufacturers because there's this tendency to want better and better performance. Let's make things more efficient. But in fact, that's, that, that, that may not cause or may not enable manufacturers to sell more chips. Uh, they may sort of just stand still. Because, so it's sort of an interesting, interesting, interesting result. Um, anyway, so, so, so let's go ahead and sort of make some estimates just for fun. Um, uh, beta, we know. GDP, we have those estimates from uh, the EIA, that about $140 trillion per year for the world. Uh, we have their estimates for cost of energy. Let's assume a power input density that's something like uh, an amp per square millimeter. Um, that's a little bit higher than what's being used now in solid state lighting, but it's not out of the realm of possibility. And a lot of people are moving in that direction, trying to drive these chips harder and harder. And I'll talk about that in, in, in just a minute. And assume this like a two or three volt, uh, say a three volt uh, drive voltage. And so that ends up being something like 300 watts per square centimeter. Um, and let's assume a duty cycle of about one fourth. So that means that the lamp is on for six hours per day, which is about what is true for traditional lighting uh, right now. Uh, and if you plug all those numbers in, what you find is that the area that you would need to light the world is something like 1.3 square kilometers, uh, which actually, when I first looked at that, I thought that was kind of a small number. Uh, but, but that corresponds to about 240 American football fields. So, so then that seems like kind of a big number. Um, so, so, so now with this area in hand, now you can calculate other things, like what would the area turnover be? Uh, because after all, some of these chips will burn out every year. And so in steady state, you need to supply that many chips that have burned out to sort of sustain the total area um, in, in, in a steady state. And so that's DADT, that's the area turnover. And that's basically just the area that you need to light the world divided by the time that they burn out. Um, but you have to normalize that time by the duty cycle because the lamps are not on all the time. You also have to normalize that area by the yield because not every chip that you make might be a good chip. And if you assume something like a life of 25,000 hours, and actually solid state lamps will, as many of you know, have, have the potential to last much longer, although there's a tendency to drive them harder and harder to get more light out of a chip. So that tends to drive the... Uh, the uh, lifetime down a little bit, but still actually doesn't go down all the way to 25,000 hours. The reason why I chose 25,000 hours is that, is, that, is, that, is that consumers have sort of a finite time span over which they're willing to uh, uh, y y uh, use a lamp. 25,000 hours, I think, corresponds to maybe 10, 15, 20 years. And people don't usually buy lamps with that sort of long time horizon uh, in mind. So we, we often truncate at 25,000 hours when we calculate these various costs and lifetimes and things. Um, and then if you assume a yield of, say, three-fourths, maybe could be higher in steady state where man all the manufacturing bugs have been worked out. But it also could be uh, it's definitely much lower right now. Um, what you end up with is something like an area turnover of 0.15 square kilometers per year, um, which is about 28 football fields. Per year, so this is the area turnover that you would need in steady state to sustain the uh, this uh, amount of area necessary to uh, light the world. 
Um, okay, so now to put those numbers in perspective, uh, here I've, I show a table of other sort of really big electronics applications that consume a lot of area. Okay, so I'm not talking about cost here or, or the, the, the revenue, you know, but just, just the sheer area of, 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 of the uh, semiconductors or, 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 or uh, whatever, you know, electronics that are, that are used for these applications. And, of course, some of these are really huge. Um, so liquid crystal displays, and, and, and I hope these numbers are right. I, I got them in part from Corning. <laughs> um, but, uh, and, and liquid crystals, of course, d in, intersect in a very big way, you know, Corning's, uh, Corning's business as the leading supplier, I believe, for the glass substrates for, for, for LCDs. And, and with continuing innovation coming out all the time, I, I think in last week's uh, Fortune magazine there was a, a little one-page blurb on the gor Gorilla Glass that, uh, you know, that was pioneered here uh, at, 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 at Corning. Um, so anyway, look at Crystal's displays. Of course, that's a gigantic and, and growing very, very quickly uh, market. Uh, and the approximate area turnover here I've listed as something like about 230 square kilometers per year. And I looked up the statistics on the area of Corning the city <laughs> here in New York, and that's a, it's, 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 I think it's about two and a half times the city of Corning is, is this area. That corresponds to about 43,000 American football uh, fields or so. Um, then the second is solar cells. That's also growing like crazy, this, this, this market, and it had an approximate area turnover last year, 2009, of about 64 square kilometers per year, which is about 11,800 American football fields, and that's about the size of Manhattan. Um, and the next down is silicon electronics. In 2009, as many of you know, there was a little bit of a slump, so it's not growing as fast as these other markets. But nevertheless, it's a very big market, and the approximate area turnover is something like 4.4 square kilometers per year. That's about 800 American football fields. And, 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 and now we're getting into smaller units. That's like twice the size of Monaco, <laughs> the, the country. Um, and on this scale, solid-state lighting actually seems a little wimpy. <laughs> um, and so now, in fact, we're flash-forwarding to 2030. So we're comparing these 2009 numbers with, with 2030 projections for solid-state lighting. Uh, and so here, the approximate area turnover we just estimated was something like maybe 0.15 uh, square kilometers per year. That's about 28 football fields, American football fields. That's about one-fourth the size of Vatican City. Uh, so on this scale, again, it sort of seems a little bit... Uh, a little bit wimpy, but if you compare it with other 3.5 uh, uh, technologies like galley marsonide electronics, uh, uh, which are used fairly heavily in cell phone uh, technologies, we are much larger than galley marsonide electronics, maybe a factor of uh, uh, five or six, uh, five or six uh, or, so, or so in area. So, so I think maybe the, the moral sort of of this little story is, or this slide is that galley nitride, in terms of raw area, okay, that is, I'm not talking about market value, that's a different, different prop proposition, but just in terms of raw area, it will of course be dwarfed by these other very, very large uh, applications for electronic materials, but it may be the biggest 3.5 uh, application in terms, of, in terms of area. Of course, we don't know what galley Marsden Electronics is gonna do between 2009 and 2030. There may be suddenly some amazing things that, that cause it to uh, increase in, in, in area by another factor of five or six. Um, uh, let's see. Okay, so, 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 so far I've talked about this hypothetical world in 2030 where lighting is, is more efficient, it's cheaper, and that cheapness of light has spurred new uses of, of light, so we end up consuming more, uh, more of it. Um, so, so, so what would be necessary for solid state lighting, for, its, for the evolution of solid state lighting, for this to happen, for that kind of world to actually take place, uh, to, to, you know, to happen. Okay, so one thing, of course, is that it has to become more efficient um, than it is now. It's about 16% efficient now, and it's gotta get to maybe whatever, 50, 70, maybe even 100% uh, efficient in order to make this new world, new world happen, and that may be enough. 
it may be enough for lighting to simply get more efficient because as it gets more efficient, its cost goes down. As its cost goes down, it spurs more uses and previously uneconomical uses of light suddenly become economical with this decrease in price. So it's possible that all that needs to happen is, is, is efficiency has to improve. It may be that that's not enough. Um, when you think about previous generations of lighting technology, um, all of them have come with not just more efficiency, but they've come with new features, new, 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 new characteristics that allow lighting to be used in situations where it could not be used before. So for example, incandescent light bulbs uh, are much safer than the previous generation of combustion-based light sources. Uh, incandescent light sources has, have instant on and instant off. So there's, there are things that you can do where you only need light for, for a minute um, instead of for several hours. Um, so, there, so there are many uses for incandescent light bulbs that were made not just economical, but made possible not just because it was more efficient, but because it had these new features, these new characteristics. So it is very possible that solid state lighting will have to do the same thing if it is indeed going to spur on these new and productive uses. So in the next uh, couple of view graphs, what I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time talking about what solid state lighting might need to do, not just in terms of efficiency, but a little bit in terms of func new functionality. Um, so, so here on this next slide, I show the anatomy of a state-of-the-art uh, commercial solid-state lighting lamp. This particular lamp is a so-called thin film flip chip design pioneered by Philips LumiLeds, uh, or LumiLeds before it got bought by Philips. <laughs> um, and it's basically a one millimeter on a square uh, gallium nitride, gallium nitride based uh, chip uh, driven by about 0.7 amps um, and mounted to a ceramic submount for heat sinking. Uh, these devices are driven pretty hard so they do get very hot. Um, and so, so heat sinking is, 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 is a very big deal. Uh, I remember when I was younger in my research career, somebody once told me that in the end, electronics is all about heat sinking. <laughs> no matter what, it always ends up being about heat sinking. And I guess the same thing will be true for solid state light. No matter how efficient it gets, uh, maybe it gets to 90% efficiency, 95, you know, you will still want to drive it harder and harder so you can get more lumens per little chip. And so it will still be heat sinking <laughs> that may be the, the bottom line. I'm not sure. But, um, now, on top of this chip is a, you'll notice a, a green and red phosphor. So some of the blue light leaks through, uh, and some of the blue light is, is absorbed and then converted into red and green light by these phosphors. And the combination of that uh, red, green, and blue produces a, a, a warm white, white light that is very pleasing to the human eye. So, so this is a very nice, uh, very nice white light. Uh, with the characteristics here, 16% efficiency, which just translates to about 66 lumens per watt, um, a CRI of about 85, and a relatively warm color temperature of something like 3,100 uh, degrees Kelvin. Now, this 16% number, of course, seems kind of low, and, and some of you may have heard of higher numbers. There are certainly higher numbers in the research labs, um, but there are actually even higher numbers in some commercial applications as well. And the reason is that you can, you can, you can't, sort of in, in some artificial way, you can increase this number by backing off on certain characteristics of the light. So for example, you could replace this green and red phosphor with a yellow phosphor, which is what people do for the sort of typical flashlights that, 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 you, often, uh, that you often see. And the yellow, the yellow phosphor is better matched to the human eye response. The human eye, of course, peaks at roughly 550 uh, five nanometers in the green, and so, so the yellow is much, much better matched to the human eye, but because you're missing the red component, that kind of light source has a much poorer color rendering index, or it renders the colors of objects in the environment around you uh, much less well. Um, so, you can, so you can back off on CRI in order to get a higher efficiency if you want. Um, you can also drive this uh, device not as hard. Okay, so, and I'll talk about this in a minute. The harder you drive these devices, as it turns out, for these indium gallium nitride devices, there's something called efficiency droop, which causes the efficiency to decrease. 
um, a little bit. And so you can increase the efficiency a little bit by, well, not just a little bit. You can increase the efficiency by backing off on this current drive. But if you back off on this current drive, then, of course, you're producing less light uh, in the chip. And if you produce less light from the chip, then the effective cost of the lamp is higher per lumen that the lamp is going to emit. And so, you, so, and, and so, and so, you, so the trade-off is that you increase the cost. So if you want the cost to be as low as it can be, then you don't want to back back off on that, and then you end up with an efficiency that, again, is not so, seemingly not so high, about 16%. Okay, so what would it take to increase that 16% to 50% or as close to 100% as one could get? And, and, and in fact, that's not so easy to do. If you analyze the sub-efficiencies or the efficiencies of the sub-components that the lamp is composed of, um, and I've indicated them here, what you find is that all of those sub-efficiencies are actually not that bad. Um, so, for example, if you start with the blue LED um, and analyze the sub-efficiencies even within the blue LED, uh, they're listed here, the joule loss, um, uh, just due to resistive heating in the device, is something like 10%, which means that you're left with something like 90% of your energy. That's actually pretty good. Um, Internal quantum efficiency at low power, that's, you know, every electron hole pair that is injected in gives rise to some, potentially gives rise to a photon. Um, and that's about a 75% efficient process. That is 75% of those electron holes give, give rise to a real photon. And that's also not bad. This droop that I mentioned earlier, this efficiency droop, is something like, um, uh, takes away about 30%, but that leaves behind about 70%. So again, that's not too bad. Um, light extraction, you'll notice that this, there's this sort of nano texturing at the top of this chip, and that's in order to randomize the um, reflection angles that the, uh, that the light that's emitted by the in-GAN chip makes on its way out. And as those incident angles are randomized, that helps minimize the total internal reflection that you would otherwise, that would otherwise trap light inside the chip. So light extraction is actually getting very good. It's about 80% efficient. Um, but the problem is that these four efficiencies are in series. So if you, so you have to multiply them, and when you multiply them, you end up with something that's 38%. So it's not that high. So it's kind of like death by a thousand cuts. Each cut, it really isn't so bad, but there's a lot of cuts. And each one takes a little bit out of you, and so you end up with something that's not so high. Okay, the same is true for the phosphor in the package. The internal quantum efficiency of these phosphors is getting really, really good. Um, it's about 90%. Efficient. That is to say, photons that come in and excite the phosphor uh, and the fraction of those that actually uh, lead to emitted red and green light, uh, that's about 90% uh, or so. The Stokes deficit, that is to say, you're absorbing a blue photon, you're re-emitting a green or red photon. There's this Stokes uh, inefficiency that you sort of are stuck with. Um, that inefficiency takes away about 24%. Uh, of, your, of, your, of your energy, basically. But that leaves behind 76%. So again, that's not so bad. Um, these phosphors, as, 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 as you know, are composed of polycrystalline grains. And these polycrystalline grains can scatter light. And that scattered light, both scattered light from the blue, uh, original blue light, as well as re-scattered light from the, from the, from the green and, and red re-emitted light, um, that can lead to some light getting back into the chip or some other part of the lamp where it can be absorbed. And that leads to a 20% loss, but again, that leaves behind 80%. Um, but again, you have to multiply these efficiencies out, uh, and you end up with a serial efficiency that's something like 54, uh, 54%. Okay, then finally, uh, the, something that we sometimes call the spectral efficiency. That is to say, just because of the peculiarities of the phosphors that are used right now, um, this red phosphor, for example, emits a little bit too far in the deep red, um, where the human eye isn't quite as sensitive, um, and, 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 and it's further out into the deep red that you really need for good CRI. Um, and also because it tends, that red phosphor tends to absorb a little bit better in the deeper blue, so you end up using a blue LED that's maybe a little bit shifted into the deeper blue than you would really need for optimal matching to the human eye. So you end up with a spectral mismatch, I guess, between the light that's coming out and the human eye response. And that spectral mismatch is sort of an effective inefficiency of maybe 22%. So that means that the spectral efficiency is one minus that, so it's about 78%. So actually, 
again, you put all these numbers together, it's really not so bad. 78%, 54%, 38%, but these three numbers have to be multiplied together, and so you end up with something that's like 16% efficiency. So you're, so, so again, this is this sort of death by a thousand cuts uh, kind, of, uh, kind of situation. Okay, so, so what would we need to do in order to uh, improve the efficiency way beyond 16%, uh, if possible. And so here on the left, um, I show two what one might call grand challenges for efficiency. That doesn't mean there aren't a whole lot of smaller challenges, and if you integrated them out, maybe they would equal uh, a big challenge. Maybe one of those would, it, would by themselves be a, be a grand challenge. But here I've, I've sort of called out two. These are two that the community is definitely looking at very, very uh, uh, intensely right, right now. Uh, so the first one is this sort of eliminate blue LED efficiency droop uh, problem that I mentioned before. And here I show uh, sort of a, uh, uh, internal quantum efficiency, sort of an efficiency uh, as a function of drive current uh, in amps per square centimeter. And you see that there's this sort of peak and then it rolls over at higher currents. And it all comes about because there's some, there seems to be some nonlinear, non-radiative recombination channel in these in-GAN LEDs um, that causes this rollover. And some people ascribe it to an Auger-like effect. And so this is this uh, constant C times some carrier density uh, cubed. Um, and it's competing with this BN squared, which is the spontaneous emission recombination channel that you want. That's the good channel. Um, it's also maybe competing somewhat with this defect uh, mediated recombination channel, Shockley Reed Hall. These two are parasitic, the two at the ends, the AN and CN cubed are parasitic, and it's only the middle one that you really want. So there's something going on, and right now there's just quite a bit of controversy over the physical mechanism uh, that's underlying this, um, this uh, nonlinear. Uh, contribution. So understanding the physical mechanism for that and then getting out to drive currents that are, I, I've depicted here a dashed line at 200 amps per square centimeter. That's even higher than the uh, uh, 100 amps per square centimeter, square centimeter that I indicated before. If you could actually get to 200 amps per, per square centimeter, it turns out you would have a cost structure for solid state lamps that is pretty typical, but pretty similar to what it is for traditional uh, lighting. And for tr traditional lighting, the cost structure is something like um, uh, the purchase cost of the lamp amortized over the life of the lamp is something like one sixth of the of the of the operating cost of the lamp. That is, so so the operating cost, which is basically the fuel, the electricity that you're burning, um, is about six times bigger than the than the purchase cost. And 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 you like to be in that kind of situation. You like to be in a situation where the lamp is not the dominant. Well, unless you're a lamp manufacturer, you, you want to be in, in a situation where the lamp cost is not the dominant, dominant cost. And so, so if you could get to 200 amps per, per square centimeter for, for solid state lamps, you would, again, be in that rough situation where the lamp cost is not the, not the dominant feature. It's the electricity cost uh, for, 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 for light. So 200 amps per square centimeter is a good target. And you can see that the turnover is well before then. Not only that, but the absolute uh, uh, efficiencies are are not that high. So this is a big grand challenge for the solid state lighting community and even indeed the physics and material science community to sort of understand the underlying mechanism for that droop. Okay, the second grand challenge that I wanted to highlight is something that one might call fill in the shallow red electroluminescence gap. And the reason why we think of that as being a grand challenge is that the current generation, as I mentioned, of phosphors, well, especially the red phosphor has two counts against it. Um, one, one count is that, of course, it has a Stokes loss that's, that's unavoidable, unless someone can come up with some way of, of converting one blue pho photon into two red photons. That would be very cool. Um, but un, un, unless someone comes up with that and, and you end up with one blue photon in and one red photon out, then you, then you have this unavoidable Stokes loss. That Stokes loss, of course, increases the bigger the energy difference between the two photons. And so from the blue to the green, it's a hit, but it's not such a terrible hit. But from the blue to the red, it's a, it's a significant hit. So it's something that you, don't, that you really don't want if you can avoid it. 
Okay, the second reason is that that red phosphor, as I mentioned earlier, is not the current generation of red phosphors is not very well matched to the human eye response. So here I've, I've sort of separated. This is a spectrum of a typical state-of-the-art warm white LED. There's, there's, a, there's a blue spike here to the blue LED. There's sort of a green, you can almost imagine there's a green Gaussian uh, phosphor uh, peak here that's you know somewhere around 530 nanometers or so, and then there's this red uh, phosphor peak which I've drawn, I've, I've separated out as this dashed red line here, and you can see that it's quite broad. Um, and 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 in fact, the ideal red is this dashed line here at 614 nanometers. Um, you really don't need any red light beyond 614 nanometers in order to give a very good degree of color rendering, that is rendering of, of typical objects in the environment around, around you, even red, even, even red objects. So any light that's beyond 614 nanometers is sort of wasted. It's, it's, it's in, this is the human eye response here, this white curve. It's anything beyond 614 nanometers is sort of in the fringe of the human eye response and, 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 and is not really, nece not really necessary. So you see a ton of this red phosphor light is actually down here, out here, out here in the wings. So, so finding some electroluminescent material that emits in the shallow red. This is really not deep red. This is 614 is really sort of shallow. Well, it's almost orange, actually. It's, it's kind of interesting. Um, would be very, very good. As, as many of you know, indium gallium phosphide, aluminum indium gallium phosphide materials are pretty good semiconductor electroluminescent materials in the deep red. They're very, very good at 650 nanometers or so. But when you get down to 614, they really start to... Uh, 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 peter out. And, li and likewise, indium gallium nitride materials are really good in the blue, and they're starting to get better in the green. Raj, I know, is doing a lot of work in the green, but they start to peter out in the, in, in the shallow uh, orange-red uh, as well. Okay, so this is efficiency. Last thing I want to mention is, okay, so I, I had also mentioned functionality. What can solid-state lighting do that would increase its functionality even beyond what it already can do? I mean, it already has a lot of counts for it, like it's com very compact, uh, it has a very long lifetime, it's very reliable, it's, it's vibration resistant, it's all, all those sorts of things. So it already has a lot of new features. But here I've called out something that is sort of an, I think of as a, as a really emerging um, sort of grand challenge for functionality. And it's what one might think of as bringing luminaire functionality to the chip. And so in the, in the, in the parlance of lighting, luminaires are, are, the, are the sockets, kind of, uh, and then the lamps are what you screw into the socket. And so luminaires are the things that do the final direction, direct, directing of, of, and focusing or whatever of, uh, of the light. And here I show a state-of-the-art luminaire um, used for theater lighting. And as you can see, it does lots of things. It, it rotates, it swivels, it uh, focuses. Uh, there's you know lenses, movable mechanical lenses inside. It has gel filters inside as well, so you can change the chromaticity of the of, of either the white light or if you actually want colored light, it can change the chromaticity of that uh, as well. Um, and it's all digitally controlled. Um, and if you have a, an array of these, like is used in very high-end stage lighting, if you have an array of these things, you can basically, you basically have the ultimate control over the lighting of a scene, over any point on the stage. Um, and, so, and so when I say bring luminary functionality to the shift, the idea is that this, of course, is very expensive. Um, and so even actually high-end stage lighting, you often don't have that many of these, you may only have a few because they're very, very, even on stage, for stage lighting purposes, they're very expensive. So the idea is that, is there a way to bring that kind of functionality down into the chip, or at least into the lamp? Maybe it's a hybridized lamp with multiple chips, but, 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 but it's something that one could imagine doing with semiconductor technology where you have MEMS, you have movable mirrors, you have all sorts of cool things. Uh, one could imagine maybe bringing that kind of functionality down to the chip driving the cost down quite a bit and bringing that kind of directability, uh, focusability uh, to ordinary lighting situations as opposed to reserving it for only the upper, the high-end uh, stage lighting uh, kind, of, uh, kind, of, uh, kind, of, kind of situation. Okay, so, so that 
I think that brings us full circle. Um, I started out talking about how lighting might not just be about energy savings, but it might be about human productivity as well. And, and, and of course, we know that it does in the past, it has in the past had a huge impact on productivity of animals and, 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 and humans. And in fact, if indeed lighting has that kind of future where it's not just saving energy, but it's actually enhancing human productivity, in a way, that's a much more interesting world. That's a world where solid state lamps aren't just a one for one replacement. Uh, your incandescent bulb burns out, and okay, I'm going to go and replace it with a solid state lamp that will last 10 times longer, will be more efficient, and all of that. But instead, it will be a world where we're looking for new ways in which lighting can be used to, uh, to enable us to be more productive um, as a society and as, and, and, and as a world. Uh, and with that, thank you very much. <laughs>
then, of course, it is sort of an integrated heat management issue. The phosphors are getting hot. And in fact, the phosphors, in some situations, are more temperature sensitive than the chip itself. And they're more thermally isolated from the heat sink as well. So they actually get hotter. And so that's a big issue with the phosphors. But there are other archit architectures that people are considering for how you place the phosphor. Um, you can place the phosphor somewhere else as well and have it separately heat. So sometimes people call them remote, remote phosphors. And then you decouple the two heat issues. One is the heating of the phosphor due to its own inefficiency. Um, but you also decouple it from getting hot because the chip is also generating, generating heat. In fact, decoupling the phosphor from the chip has not only an advantage from a heat management point of view, it also has some advantages from a, from a um, scattering and absorption point of view in the sense that now scattered light coming from the phosphor, you can manage that scattered light so that it doesn't go back into the chip. Um, where the chip has various things like contacts and whatever that are absorbing. And so you can, in principle, make the whole configuration more efficient that way at the expense of, of it's no longer sort of an integrated unit. Now somehow you've, you've created a slightly bigger architecture. But, but you know, there could be some, some, some enhanced functionality as well from that. So, so the major, really, stuff that you, that you sort of can't get around is this blue LED stuff. That's really the heat dissipation problem that you're, you know, so that's like 60 whatever percent or so right now that you're kind of, that you're kind of stuck with that. That's roughly the number that you, uh, you know, that, that, that you mentioned. Let me ask if there are any questions in, from CETC or Corning West Coast. None from Corning West. Very good presentation. Thank you. Anything from CETC? <laughs> well, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Tsar. Mm -hmm.